Welcome back. We have got as far as um, deriving the finite dimensional weak form for um, 3D linearized elasticity. What we are going to do in this um, segment is uh, essentially press ahead with the formulation. And of course, you know how this proceeds. We essentially have to define basis functions, construct uh, representations for the fields that we care about, and go ahead and compute the integrals that arise in the weak form. OK? So um, I'm going to call this uh, segment the finite dimensional weak form and basis functions. OK, and um, remember just uh, the, the integral equation we are working with is the following. I'm not going to put down the whole um, finite dimensional weak form in all its glory, but just remind ourselves of, of what we are trying to um, so accomplish here, right? We are trying to solve the following equation, integral over omega um, wh i comma j sigma h i j dv equals integral over omega w h i f i dv plus this uh, curious sum of integrals. which has this form. Sorry, the W bar is not required. W H I, T bar I, DS. And I'm not going to state it now, but just recall that on the last uh, integrand, we don't have a sum implied. OK, um, we have this, and of course, there are constitutive relations, and we've studied those in some, in, in some depth. As, as you imagine now, we, we essentially have to define basis functions, right? Uh, and and uh, in defining basis functions, as before, we will do this by constructing a uh, partition of our domain. Right? We partition our domain as follows. basis, our uh, domain of interest, which is really the body that we want to solve and a, a linearized elasticity problem over. Uh, that's our domain omega. Uh, actually, let me leave that outside of the body because we'll confuse it with other things. Okay, that's omega. Uh, we have the usual decomposition of the boundary subsets. And um, right, the, the way we do the decomposition is essentially the way we did it in the case of um, the 3D uh, elliptic problem with uh, scalar variables, right? Uh, the kinds of elements we consider there are admissible here as well, okay? And to fix ideas, let's uh, look at um, hexahedra. Okay, so that is an element omega uh, omega e, and um, that part the partition of the domain is as always um, given to us as follows: union over e of all these um, open element subdomains closed gives us a closure of the body. Okay, um, as always we have omega e one. Uh, intersection omega e2 
is the empty set, right? They're disjoint. OK, we have this. And we're going to go ahead and construct our basis functions using this sort of decomposition. Equivalently, now that we've talked about it, we could also have had a tetrahedral, a decomposition into tetrahedral. OK? All right. Uh, the way we are going to go ahead and, and construct our uh, basis functions is, uh, as we know very well, uh, is to, cons to, to consider nodes on the element. And again, just to fix ideas, as I'm drawing things out here, I'm going to consider uh, bilinear, sorry, trilinear hexahedra. So those are our nodes. We only have nodes at the vertices. OK. Um, and we know that. OK, we know that detail. Um, right. So now let me suppose that this is uh, element uh, omega e. Right. This is the element that we started out with which has now been essentially expanded out here. OK, that's element omega e. And uh, that is our node A equals 1 for the element, right? I'm following here uh, the local numbering of nodes. OK, that's 2, 3, 4, and so on. We are quite expert at this by now. All right, and uh, we are going to construct our basis functions from these um, from these nodes. The way we'll do this is um, to to essentially define these basis functions uh, on the nodes, and um, we are going to define write the basis functions as before, as n a. Okay, our basis functions. This is our basis function at node A. OK? Um, let me say here local node A. Now, something you may have noticed is um, over the past minute or two, as I've introduced um, the nodes and the numbering, I have not been calling them. Uh, I've not yet started calling them degrees of freedom, okay? Whereas earlier, I was using the term, I was using A more often for the, in, in the context of degrees of freedom. But here, I'm being very careful to call them nodes. Uh, and, and, and here's why, okay? The reason is the following. We're going to construct a um, representation for our uh, trial solution, right? And remember, our trial solution here is the displacement field. That's um, component I over element E, right? Now, we are going to use a um, representation where the basis functions will be exactly the same basis functions that we are so familiar with, right? If we are doing trilinears, we know what these are, right? They are the same basis functions. However, we, um, and, and the sum, of course, is over A going from 1 to number of nodes in the element. Okay. However, each one of these basis functions is multiplied by a degree of freedom vector. Okay. What this means is that for component UHI, I have D, A, I, E. Okay. And we need to recall here that I runs over 1 the number of spatial dimensions. Okay? So, so this is a little different because now, if you think about it, how many degrees of freedom does this um, element have? Okay? So the number of degrees of freedom in omega e Right, or on omega e, right, is, what is it? Is it just the number of nodes as it was in the previous problems we were doing? 
no, correct? So it is actually, in the general case, it's number of nodes in the element times number of spatial dimensions, okay? Whereas earlier, the number of nodes on the element was the um, same as the number of degrees of freedom in the element. Things are a little different now, okay? So what we have here is, um, another way to write this is the following. We use uh, direct notation, right? So now that is the displacement field over element E. And this is sum over A, N A, D A E as before, except that that D A E, whereas it was a scalar for our uh, problems of uh, scalar variables, is now a vector, right, for our problem of vector variables. So, and, and what we have here is U H E, and D A E both belong to R3, right, the three dimensional vectors. Okay, so sorry for seeming to flog a dead horse, but what we have here are vector degrees of freedom at each node. Okay. And this is a um, particular approach that we take for this problem. It is not necessarily universal, okay? So we have here a representation for a vector field, and what we're seeing is that the basis function here is scalar, just as we've been doing all along. The degrees of freedom here carry the vector information. Right? And this is common for the kinds of problems we're doing, definitely for, for elasticity of, of, of any kind, mechanics of any kind. It is not the same, for instance, however, uh, in the case of the problem of electromagnetics. Okay? It's common in that case to construct uh, finite element formulations where the basis functions are vectors and the degrees of freedom are scalars. Okay, it's, it's just a difference. It's, it's a, a, a difference in to, to do with um, the requirements of each problem and so on, the mathematical requirements. All right, so, so that's something to note here. And, and then, of course, it's, it's the same thing for the, for the weighting function. We have WHIE equals sum over A, NA, C, A, I, E, using coordinate notation, right, where we know that I equals 1 to number of spatial dimensions, right, and using a direct notation that would be W, H, E equals sum over A, N, A, C, a, E, okay? As we noted above, W, H, E, and C, A, E are 3D vectors, vectors in R3. Okay, the, um, the next thing we need to do, if we are happy with this, is to just remind ourselves of what the basis functions are. And these are constructed in exactly the same way that we know, all right? So what we are saying here is that as before, if we have a, an arbitrary hexahedral element, okay, that's omega E, we construct it as all, as uh, as always, really, from a uh, by unit domain Right, and um, 
everything everything proceeds just as before nothing new here okay so in this setting we would have um, in in this domain again we would have a equals 1 2 3 4 would be in the back 5 6 7 8 right and this is a bi unit domain so this point is um, as always minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 right and so on that point uh, number 7 would be 1 1 1 and so on right we know this very well now okay this is how we construct our uh, basis functions, having defined uh, these uh, coordinates c1, c2, c3. What we say is that, as always, in a um, c1, c2, c3, will be constructed from, um, you know, the, uh, these, these uh, one-dimensional Lagrange polynomials, right? Uh, Na tilde, and I forget what I call them. Let me suppose I call them um, A bar C1 N tilde B bar C2 n tilde c bar c3. I may have used different uh, uh, notation for the for the indices a bar, b bar, c bar before, but but I think by now we understand this very well, right? Each of these, as we recall, is a 1D Lagrange polynomial. Okay, and we know exactly how to construct these in the case of bilinear, sorry, trilinears, triquadratics, and so on. Okay, uh, and since we are so good at this now, I, I don't need to belabor the point. So I, I'm going to tell you right away that, as always, we also use the uh, the same sort of um, basis functions to interpolate the geometry. Right, that part of course continues exactly the same because even when we were solving the linear elliptic problem in 3D with scalar variables, the geometry still was fully 3D and the geometry was indeed uh, defined by, uh, by position vectors and so on, right? So that bit is exactly the same. Okay, so we have x um, e as a function of the c vector, all right? That's exactly the same map that we had before, okay?